the lecture video on diseases of the heart, blood vessels, and lungs, the chapter 21. So when we're looking at coronary artery disease, we're really talking about the problem of atherosclerosis, which is an inflammatory process. So now you're already thinking back to the omega-3s and everything else that we've talked about up to this point. But when we're looking at plaque, it's raised fibrous plaque. It's on the intima, the inside of the blood vessels. So we're born with nice, clean arteries, and then they adopt the American diet. And so what happens to your blood flow? It begins to be restricted. Does that raise or lower your blood pressure? Yes, it raises it. So what are some other things that people could do that would injure their arteries? Well, we can have damage to the intima by smoking, not controlling your blood pressure, blood sugar not under control, whether it's type 1, type 2, or they have insulin resistance, and that's type 2 diabetes. When they have a high LDL, which means they have more plaque buildup going on in their arteries, and lower HDL, which is the one that reverses it. But we cannot do other things. We can have an infection, we can have periodontal disease, oxidative stress, and we said coronary heart disease is an inflammatory process. And in fact, C-reactive protein is a marker of inflammation. On the positive side, now that we've added folate to our food, that actually has helped to reduce the amount of the C-reactive protein. So in America, that's not as much of a problem as it has been in the past. So we said it's raised fibrous plaque. And so a lot of people think you can go in and root a root in your body. You know, you put a stent and that solves the problem. It doesn't. The plaque usually contains fatty material like lipoprotein. So again, the, the fatty streaks begin to accumulate. And we saw this in the video that I had in your notes when we did lipid disease. So when we're looking at the breakdown of deaths, you, they're really going to have some overarching, you know, areas. You know, if you have a stroke, it's usually related to high blood pressure. So this just gives you an idea that coronary heart disease is our biggest problem. Is it more likely to happen in men or women, or it doesn't matter? It doesn't matter. The major risk factor for plaque development is LDL, cholesterol. Why? We covered this in the lipid chapter, but remember oxidized LDL attaches to the intima and it forms fatty streaks. So that can cause blood clots to develop. If you have a blood clot, where is it? If it's in a critical artery, it can lead to a heart attack. That means the tissue serviced by that artery lost its oxygen and nutrient supply and it dies. It's also known as acute myocardial infarction and we'll cover that um, later on. So if we're looking at cholesterol, do humans make cholesterol? Yes, we make all that we need. And it's a soft fat-like substance and we need cholesterol, that's why we make it because it's found in all our cell membranes. It's the precursor of our bile salt, steroid hormones. It cannot dissolve in the blood, so we transfer as lipoproteins. Now we're going to get to some new areas that are a little deeper dive into what we've been talking about. Chylomicrons have a high lipid content. They're dietary cholesterol with a small amount of carrier protein. They're mostly composed of triglyceride. They accumulate in the portal blood after a meal, and then they are efficiently cleared by the enzyme lipoprotein lipase. Again, we know it's an enzyme, it ends in ASC, and that's what breaks down. So very low density lipoproteins, if our patient came in and they had a lipid panel done, we're going to know what their VLDLs, IDLs, etc. are. But with VLDL, it's a large triglyceride content, about 20% cholesterol. It's formed in our liver where we make cholesterol from the endogenous fat. We have inter Immediate density, those are carry the endogenous triglyceride to the cell. In fact, they carry two thirds or more total plasma cholesterol from the breakdown of VLDL. They're about 40% cholesterol. Low density lipoproteins, star, asterisk, know this. Low density lipoproteins are the worst. They carry two thirds or more total plasma cholesterol from the breakdown of VLDL. Why are they so deadly? They carry the cholesterol to the cells and they deposit in the tissue. So we're developing atherosclerosis. Now they are the main agent in elevated serum cholesterol. We're going to get to what the numbers are and we're going to talk about some of that. But when someone looks at what someone's total cholesterol is, they zero in on LDL. What do we want more of? 
high density lipoproteins. They're less lipid, more protein. It has nothing to do with dietary protein, by the way, it's the molecule. And they carry cholesterol from the tissue to the liver for the breakdown and excretion. We consider them the good cholesterol because even if someone had a really lousy diet and we get them to make their changes, we know we can re reverse a lot of the damage. They are considered to be cardioprotective. They are the good cholesterol. Ideally, we want to see greater than 60. So a lot of people have been talking about eating clean. There's no quantification of what eating clean is. And so if we're looking at, let's say someone's been for 40 years is feeding an American diet, a high fat, French fry, trans fat, et cetera. So they have a lot of LDL sitting in their arteries. You just can't eat well for one or two weeks and think it's all gonna go away. It's a lifestyle change. LDL are the main agent. They are the ones that we're going to focus on a lot of our protocols on how we're going to do that. So if someone comes in, we have their total cholesterol done, we've seen what their LDL is. The next thing we look at is what is their HDL? Because if it's a man, a man already has a risk factor for heart disease just for being a male. So they are low risk. They have a um, if their HDL is low, less than or equal to 40, they are considered high risk. And you just hear the burning wells go off. Now, women before menopause will have a higher amount. People who exercise or are genetically blessed have a, greater, a number greater than 60, and that's considered to be protective. You want more HDL than LDL. So we can't change genetics, but there are some factors that are amenable or are able to be changed. Elevated LDL cholesterol, dietary lifestyle changes. If someone's a couch potato and they have a low HDL, they haven't seen the doctor in 20 years, we're gonna talk about healthier lifestyle and for many of them it's gonna get more active and they're gonna lose weight, especially around their abdominal region. And if they have high triglycerides, and that's often, it could be genetics, but they eat a lot of sweets or they're overweight, again, most of our population's overweight, so that's one of the areas that can be helped. So we know that those people that have the highest number of HDL are less likely to die. I don't think that's rocket science. I think that's pretty obvious. One thing that's a little um, more clear is that apple lipoproteins, we all have genetically determined components. They influence the structure receptor binding and metabolism. So for instance, if you got into the cardiac field, you would learn apple lipoprotein B attaches to LDL. So it transports lipids in the blood and it transports lipids in the cells for metabolic uses. So we have apple lipoprotein B100 provides the recognition site for LDL receptors. Again, we're always focusing on LDL and it causes LDL to be transported by pinocytosis into the cell. So apple lipoproteins, can we tell what's going on like we can with the total cholesterol? Sure, we can. Apple lipoproteins specifically form help spherical droplets of lipid material for transport in the bloodstream. So there are a specific protein of a combined lipid protein molecule. So we have various LDL have receptor sites for these particular apple lipoproteins. So if we're going down this line of inquiry of a family history of heart disease, we can look for defects in making apple lipoproteins. In fact, there are four major groups of lipid disorder based on underlying functional problems. Defects in making it, enzyme deficiencies, LDL receptor deficiencies, or other inherited hyperlipidemia. Hyperlipidemia, too much lipid in the blood. It's kind of the catch-all phrase that you often see in medical charts uh, for talking about someone who has high cholesterol. So you know, nutrition is always one of the factors that we're gonna to use to make lifestyle changes. So it's no different with this. We have the National Cholesterol Education Program, and we have the Adult Treatment Panel, or we also call it ATP3. Surprise, they're talking about reducing their intake of saturated fat and cholesterol. It goes right along with the dietary guidelines, just about what we've talked about up to this point. We also know that there are therapeutic dietary options to enhance LDL lowering. And we're gonna, we've done soluble fiber. We're gonna talk about plant stanols and plant stanol esters in a little while. And that's what this is an illustration of. 
So if two thirds of our population is overweight, we look at ATP3, we look at the therapeutic lifestyle change diet, they talk about lifestyle changes. Get more active, reduce your weight, eat a nutrient dense diet. And in fact, we call that the therapeutic lifestyle change diet. I know you tenderly love and care for your patients, but it's therapeutic lifestyle change. This along with the DASH diet, dietary approaches to stop hypertension, are the two best meal plans that we can have for our patients. So if we have a patient and we want them to reduce their saturated fat less than 7% of energy in the total therapeutic lifestyle changes, then that means they're going to eat more plant-centered diet. Why did we do that? Because we know that if we 1% decrease in calories from saturated, in other words, cutting our animal fats and having more salads or soups, will reduce your serum cholesterol 2%. That's a pretty good return on your investment. You make 1% change in your saturated fat and you see your serum cholesterol go down. With monounsaturated fat, so if you had broccoli and you used to put butter on it, why not have olive oil? Because now you're substituting an animal fat, saturated fat, which also has cholesterol for one that is known to be helpful. So we want to substitute monounsaturated fat like olive oil up to 20% of your calories. And that can cause a little reduction in your HDL, but not enough for us to really worry. Many people use corn oil and things like that, and those are polyunsaturated fat. Monounsaturated fat are ideal. Polyunsaturated would be like secondary on the list, and the worst that you have is saturated, of course, trans fat. Trans fat, can you think of a food that has trans fat? Anything that says partially hydrogenated or hydrogenated, so any chocolate covered candy bar, or cookie, they're gonna have trans fat. So it's somewhere in between. There is no rules that we need to limit the total fat in their diet. That was back in the 70s. We're now at the point where we want more monounsaturated fat. And in fact, the Mediterranean diet does have more omega-3s like fish, flax, and uh, the monounsaturated fats. The therapeutic lifestyle changes, we want to have more fruits, vegetables, complex carbohydrate, and less of the, the fun foods that you might have, the saturated fats, the cookies, the baked goods. We also know that we have those specific amount of percent of carb fat protein we need. And if we go too high in any one area, it has a negative effect. In fact, if they had too much carb in their diet, that could actually cause their triglycerides levels to go up. Do your patients get enough fiber? Well, we know the goal is 25 to 30 grams, but if most people are at about half of that, about 14, 15, even when I look at your food records, most of you are at about that point, adding another 10 or 25 grams more can make a difference. So that really where produce comes into that. Uh, a lot of you start your day with oatmeal or something that has, or you eat beans, and those are good sources of soluble fiber. And if we have more soluble fiber, Metamucil counts, by the way, that's five to 10 grams more, and that has a big effect on blood sugar and cholesterol. So what about protein? I've already covered it. If you used to have Chick-fil-A for lunch and you now go with a bean burger, you've substituted an animal protein for a plant protein. If we are looking at plant stanol esters, we're gonna to get to that in a minute. But that's another secret agent, and again, I'm just using Benicol, because this is the one studies would be used on. So we have numbers, and we know exactly, I actually have the PDF of where the, the specific guidelines are, but we know that LDL is our target. You come in, you're coming in your annual physical, we do your total cholesterol, we find out it's a little I, then we go in and we do LDL. Now, we know that near optimal to optimal is 100 to 129. Between you and I, we want the best for our patients, especially our loved ones. So we know that optimum, what the best results will be, is less than 100. Not easy to do if you're not exercising, eating a healthy diet. The goal isn't to use drugs, it's to use lifestyle. And if you need to use drugs, to use less of the dose of the drug. But if someone hasn't been to the doctor in like 20 years and you know they just don't wanna know what their cholesterol is, they have to have a physical, let's say for work, many times they come in and their LDL cholesterol is very high or high. 
any change that we make is going to help to reduce it. So one of the factors that the doctor would do is talk about dietary intervention. Now, we're going to cover this when we do diabetes, but metabolic syndrome is a term that probably is new to you. It's a silent kind of killer. No one really talks about it, but we do. You know, when we had the someone who carries more weight in their abdominal region, we call that android obesity, and we actually quantified men greater than or equal to 40 inches, women greater or equal to 35. That's one risk factor because that's going to be metabolically more active tissue. If they have elevated triglyceride greater than or equal to 150. If their blood pressure is high, greater than or equal to 130 over 85, you just need to have three of five of the following coming up. You could also have a patient, and oftentimes patients will meet most of the things on this list, but reduced HDL cholesterol. Again, less than 40 is a risk factor. In a man, it's a real risk factor. Women, less than 50. Or a fasting plasma glucose, greater than or equal to 100. So all we need to have is a patient to have three of five of the following to be considered. And we're going to repeat this again when we do diabetes. And we probably know loved ones that have it. What do you think? Are men are more likely to have metabolic syndrome? As we get older, are we more likely to have it? The answer is women are more likely to have it because we have the body, extra body fat. And as we get older, our metabolic rate declines, and so we're going to end up with more, our body composition changes, and we have less muscle and more fat. So we know that overweight and obese adults probably won't live as long as their normal weight peers. And in fact, obese middle-aged men and women develop heart disease sooner, and it basically supports everything that you would probably believe. So when we are looking at our patient came in, their cholesterol was too high, their HDLs were low, their LDLs were out of the roof, and so now we know that they're at risk factors. So they're going to be referred to a registered dietitian for nutrition therapy. Now if the patient follows and they kind of closely follow it, we're going to look at their blood work again for six weeks and three months and what, after we initiate the therapeutic lifestyle change diet. The more times they have a visit with a the patient, the, the better their results will be. Now, if we are looking at that and a patient makes a change, we'll see it in their blood sugar or their cholesterol. We do it in intervals of six weeks to three months. That's how long before a lifestyle change is going to be quantifiable in their blood work. So we're going to see the same number interval when we do diabetes. So at six weeks and three months, we look, and let's say they've made some change. Great, now we give them more education. We talk about exercise, healthier diet, and they further lower their LDL. They need the medication. Now, if the diet isn't working, or it's not working fast enough, or their numbers are too high for, let's say, their family risk factor, they might have medication. Now, if you take medication, you still have to follow the healthy lifestyle, just like someone who takes a, an oral hypoglycemic agent to lower their blood sugar has to eat a healthier diet. So if the treatment with a therapeutic lifestyle is unsuccessful, they continue using the drugs and they're going to follow up. So intensive LDL lowering can happen with therapeutic lifestyle change. The closer they follow it, the better the results. We can't change genetics. Sometimes genetics is just too strong. But the goal is if they do need medication, not to have as much. So if we're looking at weight control, most of our patients that come in, their cholesterol are high or carry more weight around their middle region, their blood pressure is high. Weight control, physical, increasing physical activity, you know, are going to be our first choice. And they can reduce their risk beyond LDL. They'll see their risk of metabolic syndrome drop. They're going to raise their HDL. When you exercise, you get some of those benefits from those extra HDL, which are helping to reverse the process. So if we are looking at the drug treatment, when we have numbers that are severe enough and the diet will not work, the doctor will give them a medication, but they still are supposed to eat a healthier diet. Heart disease, number one killer. Do you have to be older to have heart disease? No. My first semester teaching here, I had a normal weight, healthy young woman, 20, had a heart attack. 
I've had students that have had strokes and, you know, it, they're young compared to what you would expect. You know, you hear about someone 80 or 70 having a stroke. So heart disease is the number one killer. If you don't know your numbers and you're on campus, go to the U building and have your blood pressure checked. So the National Cholesterol Education Program has reports, and we talk about, because we, we do lots of studies on this, this is our number one killer, so well, of course we're gonna do studies, to detect, evaluate, and treat hyperlipidemia in adults. But guess what? Diet is the cornerstone. And I can even show you ATP3, any of our protocols, it talks about nutrition is the first and foremost. You don't process meds, you don't get better if you're not eating well. So, our patients are going to make changes, and they probably won't be too thrilled about it, but here you can see we have two approaches we could use, a step one or step two. A step one diet has a 3 to 10% reduction in their LDL cholesterol. And so you think, well, they're going to do something 3 to 10%. I want the best results for my patients. I'm going to give them a step two, 5 to 15% not going to work because it's a more stringent and this difference between the two is the amount of saturated fat if you had someone going out to eat all the time and eating big pieces because when you go out the portions are distorted and they're oversized so if they went from having a hamburger every day on their lunch hour now we have to have them to reduce their saturated fat so we're talking about veggie burgers and salads and other things like that. Reducing saturated fat means you're eating more of a plant-centered diet. And that's a little more than most people really want. The amount of cholesterol in the diet doesn't really matter. We're back to the saturated fat. That's the one that makes the biggest difference. Of course, trans fat are equally bad. So you're young and you're at 2,000 calories. That's the reference that we give. And so that means you get a total fat budget of 65. So if we were having your saturated fat intake, it would be 22 on a step one, 16 on a step two. I bet you can look at a lot of your fast food menus and you'll find that that would exceed it. So there are many things that we can do, but lifestyle changes, healthier diet and exercise. Why do we recommend that? Well, isn't LDL lowering our key factor? Yes, they'll, reducing animal fat, having more salads, more meatless meals, will reduce their LDL. Reducing the trans fat, you know, staying away from all those processed foods lowers your LDL. Reducing your cholesterol. Now, that's only a factor if someone has a family risk factor for that. Dietary cholesterol is like the least important of all the factors we're looking at. Saturated fat and trans fat are the top two. Now, if someone loses weight and they're, you know, losing inches, you know, they're getting a little more of a waist back, they're going to find their LDLs will go down. They'll be sleeping better. They'll feel better. We'll do their blood work. Their blood sugar goes down. Their blood pressure goes down. And remember, exercise raises your HDL. So by, although they aren't too thrilled about following it at the beginning, by the end, they begin to see that there are other benefits to doing that. So there are many things we cha can change, but we can't change we're getting older, although you may want to. You can't change being a male. That's already a risk factor for heart disease or a family history of heart disease, and we'll quantify what that is and how old that would be. But most of our patients come in are overweight. They have a higher LDL, so we can work with that. They have a low HDL, we can work with that, we'll get them more active. Their blood pressure is too high, and we're going to find out that not only affects their heart, but their kidneys and other organs as well. Diabetes, you know, type 2, most of our patients, we can get that under control with lifestyle factors. If someone's inactive, they're going to be more active. And if someone smokes, smokes anything, that's a risk factor. If someone is a male and they smoke, those are two risk factors. And the risk factors go up exponentially. So what are the numbers that we want? Well, we know that we want the desirable for our patients, especially our family members. But most of our patients come in, they're a higher risk, and that's why we're concerned, because they have a total cholesterol less than or equal to 240. We want it less than 200, the secret numbers, like we want it less than 180. We find their LDL is too high. <clears throat> And 160 to 189. And we are finding that now we're looking at BMI. 
<clears throat> excuse me. So if someone's BMI is obese and we get them to being overweight and ideally maybe back to closer to a healthier weight, we're going to lower their risk factors overall. So let's review a little bit about fats. Fats have nine calories a gram. I'm going to give you questions on if I have 20 grams of, carb, of uh, calories from fat, how many calories? 180. So we have saturated solid at room temperature. They are the most harmful for many different disease states, even cancer. Now, if you have a high fat diet, you get more calories, right? Nine calories a gram versus carb and protein, which have four. And if we reduce total fat, that is going to help to reduce our calories. And of course, if we do saturated fat, that's even better. Saturated fat, we want to replace, for instance, the butter in your recipes with a mono unsaturated fat. Saturated fat, negative. Saturated fat adversely, which means negatively affects serum cholesterol. You eat more saturated fat, your serum cholesterol level will be higher. You have a stick of butter, it's solid at room temperature. You're thinking about animal fat, it's solid. And you think about the flex that you see in that red meat, that's fat. Now, the tropical oils, coconut, palm, corn kernel, are saturated fat. It's not only found in animal food. So the typical American diet has about 12 to 14 percent of total calories from saturated fat. In the Mediterranean diet, it's not that high. And look at their risk factors. So things like cheese, butter, hot dogs, baked products, all your bakery section, those are higher fat foods. So if we have an unsaturated fat, you substitute olive oil for butter, you're lowering the cholesterol level in your diet. Unsaturated fats are found in fish and flax. Fish, you know, you think about the omega-3s. Well, our American diet's a little low on that. <coughs> so we have epidemiological study. It's studies of the Mediterranean diet. And we know that if you closely follow the Mediterranean diet, and now the new dietary guidelines actually promote this, the Mediterranean style, not the Americanized version of it, will lower your risk factor for heart disease. One of the reasons is that oleic acid, like olives, canola, are the major fat. Now, nuts, if they're not allergy, you know, you still have to watch because these are all still have nine calories a gram. You don't want to go overdue on that. So if we replace monounsaturated fat for our animal fat, we're going to help to maintain our HGL levels, but we need to keep everything under control. So if we have a vegetarian, they're not going to get saturated fat. They're not having animal fat. So they've already are less likely to have heart disease. Now, and that's why when we're looking at any cardiac programs, they're plant-centered. Now, for just having them having the unsaturated fat, we want more monounsaturated. This is the Mediterranean style diet, and we have more omega-9 and omega-3 fatty acid. We already covered the almonds, the olives, omega-9, and then omega-3 is fish, flax, sea vegetables. Now, we want more omega-3s. They reduce inflammation because atherosclerosis is an inflammatory process. Americans get too much omega-6, and we really need to reduce that. In fact, when our patients are in cardiac rehab, you know, after we've been working with them a few months, we're trying to get them to have more omega-3 because this is anti-inflammatory, more pro-inflammatory. Omega-6 fatty acid are like linoleic in our corn oil or our safflower oil. Omega-3, also called N3 fatty acid, will reduce triglyceride. And in fact, that's why I, I've noticed some of the HMOs around here keep giving their older patients omega-3 when their triglyceride levels are high. Now we're gonna talk about why that isn't always a good idea because you can have too much. With omega-3 fatty acid, you're eating more plant-based, you're eating more nuts, and you're eating fish. So all of these are omega-3s, they're anti-inflammatory. 
On the other hand, you're no longer eating, maybe just at the holidays, you might have a trans fat. Remember, if I have a vat of corn oil and I want to have something spreadable like a margarine, I force hydrogen into it so you have something you can spread on your toast in the morning. Well, studies show that any of these partially hydrogenated foods will raise your total and LDL cholesterol. And that's why the government wants zero trans fat. So what are they doing? They're just adding saturated fat to all the products like cake mixes, meal mixes. And in fact, that is negative in terms of heart disease. It's better for the manufacturer because they're so stable, they last forever. So I can go to PubMed and I can look and I can find things that are nutrition related factors that would reduce the risk factor for heart disease. Soluble fiber, plant sterols and stanols, vitamin E, folic acid, soy protein, alcohol, fish oil. We're going to talk about each one of them and whether it usually um, is effective overall. Now, a lot of the studies are done on nurses because you keep really good records, you're in a physician for a long period of time. And when we're doing these studies, we look over a long period of time. It's on real humans, you know, my studies don't count. So if you're eating animal sources, we're concerned, right? So now we're eating more nuts and we're having more margarine. Well, they're a source of vitamin E. The best source of vitamin E, which is also an antioxidant, is your vegetable oils. But you don't need to be dousing your food in that. And we're talking about homocysteine is the marker of inflammation. So when we added folic acid to our food, we reduce the inflammatory component. So the American diet right now is all fortified. So they, our food supply is now at about 400 micrograms. Remember, a pregnant woman, we're going to learn needs, or we, we learned, needs 600 micrograms. So this is just enough as a threshold, as a baseline. So we know that a B complex, increasingly patients are being told when they're over 50 to have a B complex because of the B12. And that is just includes folic acid as well. But what's wrong with eating broccoli, cauliflower, kale, all those other good foods that are good sources of folic acid? That's helpful. Now here's something new to you. There are phytosterols and stanols. In fact, there are 44 naturally occurring phytosterols. Remember phytochemicals, nobody wanted them in the beginning and now you want the lutein, xanthine. Phytochemical just means plant sterile in this case. And it will reduce your serum cholesterol when it's part of a healthy lifestyle. You just can't have it alone and have a slaughterhouse fly pizza. So where do we find these wonderful items? Well, in squash, soybeans, corn, and we can modify them to give us a stanol. And there have been over 20 human studies. And what they show is why this is so wonderful is it's not a fat blocker, but if you're on a healthy diet, the cholesterol absorption is nearly halved. So we have cholesterol lowering effect can lower your total cholesterol up to 10%. Let's say someone was at 200, and we now we've lowered to 180. But you have to continue with it. It's not a short-term thing like an antibiotic. LDL cholesterol is lowered by 14%, and HDL cholesterol and triglycerides are not effective. It tastes the same as anything else that you have. Now, it has no abnormalities. Many times you're having different foods or you're having medications that will affect your liver function. It's safe for a diabetic. It's safe for them if they're on insulin or oral hypoglycemic agents or they're on statins. Statins is things like Lipitor, Mevacor, Simvastatin, the lipid-lowering medications that many of our patients are on. So plant sterols will compete with cholesterol in our small intestine where most digestion take place. More is not better. The best effects are seen when you have it two times a day. So it is safe to have um, as part of a healthy low fat diet. So we have a lot of foods that say it's a healthy heart and they have them in the supplement, but the studies have only been done on Benicol, which is why I'm zeroing in on that. Because here's the study. If our Let's say your aunt was taking Lipitor and they lowered their total cholesterol 7% with the medication. Again, they're going to have to stick with the medication. And they started adding the plant sterile. They can get a 17% reduction. So you're getting a lot of extra oomph, right? In ammunition, it's like a booster pack, so you're helping to lower it. 
Now, a lot of these foods, they, they say they have healthier heart, and this isn't a quantifiable thing. The FDA doesn't manage this, but you want to be careful. Yes, these are plant-centered foods, except for the milk, but let's go with what the studies have shown. So plant sterols will lower LDL cholesterol by 10 to 14 percent in our patients with elevated cholesterol. So we substitute them. And that bread spread that you saw was tastes like margarine. So if you put it on your baked potato, you wouldn't notice any difference there. Soluble fiber, oats, beans, barley, anything you add water to and it swells. Well, total and LDL cholesterol will be significantly lowered and your HDL and triglycerides will not be changed. Soluble fiber, you think oats, beans, barley. It is there to help, and it also does something else. It lowers your blood sugar. So how much did the study show that you need if you want cardioprotective effects? Anywhere from six to 10 grams of soluble fiber, especially for our patients with elevated cholesterol. Why does it work? It's not a fat blocker, but the fiber binds the bile salts in the GI tract. So cholesterol is removed for bile acid synthesis in an effort to restore the bile acid pool. So it specifically promotes the synthesis of short chain fatty acids by a fermentation in the colon, and that inhibits hepatic cholesterol synthesis. Again, remember we make cholesterol in the liver. What about soluble fiber really works? Well, a meta-analysis of study of lots of studies, in this case, 67 clinical studies, and it found out it's great, right? It lowers your LDL by 2.2 milligrams per deciliter, and it will not affect your HDL and your triglyceride. Apples, oats, beans, all are sources. Now, what about grandma who, you know, has trouble getting enough fiber? What about Metamucil? That's psyllium. And in fact, that will help to boost someone's fiber intake. And it seems lately you've been seeing more ads where people are talking about it. It's just basically because they're constipated, but it is a good source of soluble fiber. Start grandma up slowly. Don't go too fast because she'll be spending her time somewhere else. Um, two to 10 grams. So we want legumes, beans. Again, these are all plant-centered foods that are high in soluble fiber. We're always emphasizing more plant than animal. Soy protein, some of you love soy, some of you don't. Well, a meta-analysis, again, a study of a lot of studies showed that soy protein of about 47 grams a day will lower your LDL cholesterol 13%, your total cholesterol by 11%, and it won't affect your HDL. So where would you get soy? Well, what about soy burgers? Or a lot of the, we'll look at some labels uh, in another class, but if you're substituting 25 grams of animal protein, so you're instead of having the moo burger, the hamburger, and you're having a soy burger, like a Boca burger, you're getting an animal protein being replaced by a plant protein. And that alone is reduced your cholesterol, and it reduces your LDL by five to 10%. So when we're looking at a product, if we want to know that we're going to get at least 25 grams, because that's what the studies show, the claim on the label would have to say, this is the FDA claim, 25 grams of soy protein a day as part of a diet low in saturated fat and cholesterol may reduce the risk factor of heart disease. There's no guarantee. You know, we know that this is what's recommended, but there's not a one-to-one -one ratio that's going to work for everyone because we don't know what they're doing the rest of the time. If we talk with a lot of people, uh, we're going to find out that some people think alcohol is cardioprotective. But as we've gone through this class, have you found any benefit for it? You have a higher risk of breast cancer, last topic, liver disease, hypertension, pancreatitis, we do that in GI disease. GI malignancy, stroke, cardiomyopathy. And then we have to be a little more specific. Now you did this when you did your driving test to understand what the, the dosage is. Now alcohol is never recommended, but what do you make wine out of? Grapes. So would you get polyphenols, catechins, quercetin? Yes, from grapes. So again, it is not really recommended. So the government, National Cholesterol Education, doesn't recommend alcohol consumption. The American Heart Association, a private organization who gets money from other people, says one to two units a day. 
but both organizations agree. If our patient has elevated triglycerides, they should not be drinking alcohol. Alcohol, like a lot of sweets, will raise your triglyceride, which is a risk factor for heart disease. Fish. I, I know a lot of you fish, but if you're looking at the omega-3 fatty acid in fish, the dose ranging from 3 to 30 grams a day. Now, fish is great because it helps to lower serum cholesterols by 3 to 40 percent. And if someone's extremely high, like we're really worried, they're seeing a cardiologist, um, it would have the biggest effect. So fish oil, reduce the stickiness of the platelet. So it improves endothelial cell function, inhibits platelet aggregation, lowers blood pressure. Remember, coronary heart disease is an inflammatory process, so it reduces that inflammation, also reduces the risk of cardiac dysrhythmia. So if you've ever taken fish oil supplements, you know that they're often recommended along with garlic, statins, and things like that. Um, we know that eating fish is the ideal way, or flax, or sea vegetables. I don't see too many people here eating sea vegetables. But more is not better. You taking too many fish oil supplements because you read on the internet it was really good. Well, you can have vitamin A and D toxicity. You can have a vitamin E deficiency. You go for that flu shot, and now you have increased bleeding or prolonged bleeding. A lot of our patients also might be on baby aspirin, and they somehow don't realize that both of them are thinning their blood perhaps too much. But most of our patients, we begin with healthier lifestyle because weight loss is not that easy. And so we know that we want to reduce their calories, but we want to have more plant-centered. By losing the weight and exercising, their blood pressure goes down, their LDL goes down, triglycerides go down, their HDL is not affected, their blood sugar goes down, and they help improve insulin sensitivity. In other words, because they're exercising, it helps to get the to better utilize their insulin. So overall, what did we find from our PubMed studies? LDL is really where it's at. Fiber works, soy protein works. So we are knowing that there are many things that we can do, but it comes with lifestyle changes. Ideally, we want to take where their animal fat intake is, saturated fat, and get it down to seven. We want them to avoid trans fat, to actually read a label to know what they're looking for. And we want to amp up the amount of monounsaturated fats they have in their diet. Cholesterol isn't our biggest concern. If any, we look at anything else, have more fruits and vegetables. Remember, that's part of the DASH diet, lowers your blood pressure. Eating more plant-centered, having more complex carbohydrate is gonna give you the best results. So when we are looking at our guidelines, do you think most of the people you know meet the guidelines for a healthy heart? Fewer than one in 10 Americans, even probably on this campus, meet at least five of the American Heart Association guidelines. And so when we're looking at these middle-aged participants, they would just need you to help make the changes they need to have better health. We've talked about the drugs. Drugs are only used along with a healthy diet. Our drugs do not replace, just like we would see with our patients when we talk about diabetes, our next topic. So when we're looking at coronary heart disease, we are talking about, and our patients can be young, they're not always old, raised fibrous plaque. It's on the intima of the arteries. And that plaque usually has fat and materials like lipoproteins, nice clean arteries. And when in the 70s, when the soldiers were coming back from the Vietnam War, we saw that they, at their young age, 17, 18, they're already at plaque buildup, which is why all of the, the craze in the 70s, 80s, you're all probably too young to know. But we've been kind of vacillating and, and we're kind of perfecting our guidelines. So we talked about where does a blood clot happen? If it's in a critical artery, heart attack. So the American Heart Association says a leading cause of damage to the arterial wall. Remember, it's an inflammatory process. Smoking, we're, we're finding some people are stopping smoking, but it includes smoking anything. High blood pressure or elevated serum and triglycerides. So we're going to talk about the different types. We're going to begin with myocardial infarction. Myocardial infarction means death to a zone or area of the heart. So 
This is all nursing wise. We gave them oxygen, IV, but what I want you to remember, what is the biggest takeaway for a nutrition class? Control hypertension. Controlling hypertension would be good for any of the different disease states we're going forward. So with a myocardial infarction, our goal is to take the pressure off the heart. So we give them a liquid diet for the first 24 hours, then we restrict to small frequent meals. We also will give them more omega-3 to reduce the risk of clots. So nutritionally, we just let the heart rest and we give them the therapeutic lifestyle change diet because now there's just no reason we can't do that. Now the sodium is the same as for you and I, so we're not asking for much, but most of our patients will be having too much. If our patient has metabolic syndrome, then we're gonna go and we're gonna focus on no alcohol, more exercise, but they've had a cardiac event, so that'll be under a doctor's advice and they probably have a stress test as well as weight management. Metabolic syndrome, silent killer, second time I'm saying, I'm gonna talk about it again, we do diabetes, because this is a huge concern. I find that in this area, most people don't identify people having a metabolic syndrome, but it's a cluster of three or more of the following. High triglyceride, hypertension, abnormal lipids, or insulin resistance. So uh, your weight's greater than 40, in a man. So all of these are risk factors and this is concerning because it's putting them at a higher risk for heart disease. Thrombosis. So when we are looking at congestive heart failure, when you're looking at it, it's a progressive weakened heart. It can't maintain adequate blood flow. The heart's pooped, right? And they have trouble breathing. They have fluid imbalance caused by edema, especially pulmonary edema. The most common cause is coronary heart disease, hypertension, cardiomyopathy, more likely in older adults, women, and those without a history of heart disease. So they have an imbalance of the capillary fluid shift mechanism. The heart just can't pump out that blood returning blood fast enough. So we end up with a disproportionate amount accumulating in the vascular system on the right side of the heart. We have a venous pressure rises. Therefore, the fluid flowing between the interstitial spaces and blood vessels is held in spaces. So we get to the hormones, and around page 486, they, they talk about the different hormones involved in blood pressure. So we're going to also review these same when we do renal disease, which has a, a component of blood pressure involved in it. So when we are looking with the hormonal mechanism, aldosterone reduces blood flow to the kidney nephrons reduces the renal blood pressure, and that triggers the renin-angiotin system, and it causes sodium and water to be absorbed, further adding to the edema problem. So the hormonal mechanism antidiuretic hormone reduces the renal blood flow, stimulates more water reabsorption, further increasing the problem of edema. I always think this kind of looks, is a good illustration of congestive heart failure. The heart isn't maintaining enough blood. We're trying to limit the sodium because the swelling, the heart isn't pumping the blood. That's why we have that. And we have the acetes. We have the pleural effusion. They can't eat a high fiber diet. They get tired eating. We have to make it soft and easy for them. So with congestive heart failure, uh, increasingly we send more patients with it. We're also talking about they're increasing their sodium-free potassium. Remember, potassium offsets the pressure effects of sodium. We have a decrease in blood circulation, depresses cell metabolism, and increases protein breakdown. So we have free potassium inside the cells is increasing. So we have increasing intracellular osmotic pressure. Sodium outside our cell, extracellular, in, is, increases to balance the pressure we still have more water reabsorption. So these are all medical things. I'm not going to test you on it, but they need oxygen. They, they just are tired. They just ha don't have enough for their physical activity, and they're going to be on several medications for the heart. Sodium, we restricted to guidelines. If someone had ascites, and we'll cover this again, we do renal disease, they're more going to be restricting their fluid. As I said, texture, soft, easy. They just don't have the energy. Small frequent meals, they shouldn't be drinking. Congestive heart failure, the heart isn't pumping out returning blood 
we reduce the sodium, we make it easier for them. Cardiac cachexia. Do you know what the word cachexia means? Cachexia means wasting. In our last topic, we'll have cancer cachexia. Cardiac cachexia is just progressive, profound malnutrition. It results from insufficient oxygen supply. The heart can't maintain sufficient blood supply to carry the nutrients. Look at them. They're hypermetabolic, hypercatabolic. It's going to be very hard to replete them. So, as I said, the patient's hypermetabolic, hypercatabolic. We're going to have drugs that we'll be giving to them. Um, but getting these patients to eat orally probably isn't going to work because they just need too much. So our overall goal for a patient with cachexia is restore heart and lung function, rebuild the body tissue. Again, if someone's very malnourished, it's very hard. So we'll have an increase of 30 to 50 percent above basal needs, and we're going to end up having to probably do tube feeding because they just can't get enough. If we have fluid sensitivity, we actually have a way of giving a lot of calories per cc. Um, we need to rebuild the body tissue, you still have the carb, to replenish the losses lost due to malabsorption. So supplementation, that would be in the tube feeding. As I said, the dietitian would worry about that, but we, if they are eating orally small frequent meals, a large meal is just going to cause too much carbon dioxide accumulation and lead to respiratory failure. So we're going to give them entro formulas with low volume, high calories. Hypertension. Do you know if you have high blood pressure? Can you tell if you have high blood pressure? So if we're looking at essential hypertension, it can lead to a stroke, heart attack, heart failure, or kidney disease. And at least 95% of those patients with hypertension would really be labeled essential hypertension. We don't know what caused it. There's a family tendency toward it, but that's not always. So it has no overt symptoms. Oftentimes a, a TIA or a stroke might be the first sign if someone doesn't seek medical care. So you know this class nutrition is the approach, dietary approaches to stop hypertension. Diet rich in fruits, vegetables, low fat dairy, reducing the amount of saturated fat. You never want saturated fat, do you? And lowering total fat can lower your blood pressure along with exercise. So we measure blood pressure. It's an indication of the arterial pressure in the upper arm. We measure it in millimeters of mercury. The top number is systolic contraction of the heart. That tends to be higher over the age of 50. That's your aging showing your arteries are less elastic. Lower value is diastolic relaxation of the heart. So if we have someone and we labor them hypertensive or they have high blood pressure, it's an increased pressure on the forward blood flow. And they have increased resistance from their blood vessels. Increased viscosity of the blood is rare. Hormones control blood pressure. So we have the enzyme system, the hormonal systems, the neuroendocrine function. I know these have been drilled into your head about the muscle tone of blood vessels in your biology classes. So we have guidelines, and the guidelines are not the same as they used to be. We have lowered the guidelines of what's accepted. A systolic reading of 130 or higher is considered hypertension. A systolic reading of 80 or higher is higher. And we know that we have more of our patients taking antihypermedications. Normal, less than 120 over 80. Elevated blood pressure, 120 to 139. 80 to 89, 120 is not acceptable anymore. And we actually have different stages. We have a stage one and a stage two. That's beyond this course, but I'm just telling you when people's blood pressure gets higher, stage one usually means one medication, stage two is two medication like an ACE inhibitor and beta blocker. Heart disease, number one killer. And a lot of people go, well, I'm 120 over 80. Well, each increment of 20 over 10 Micromillimeters of mercury double the risk factor for heart disease. So we keep saying, how low can you go? Just same thing with LDL. So if we have someone with blood pressure and they need to take the medication, they're eating a healthier diet, the goal is to reduce their risk of heart disease, right? To reduce morbidity and mortality. And that will be one of the minimal ways to do it. 
Now we know we can make dietary changes. Sodium, most of our sodium comes from processed food. Now, if we are looking at that, if you eliminate processed food, which also has saturated fat and so on, you're going to reduce a lot of it. But we know the DASH diet. We did this in minerals. And we're going to talk about it again. Because if we're eating fruits, vegetables, grain, we're increasing potassium. And that's protective against hypertension. Of course, you reduce the amount of sodium. And then we said three non-fat dairy. Because the calcium from the low-fat dairy helps to lower blood pressure. This has been studied a lot in humans. So looking at the guidelines, this is the guidelines to lower that. Just tell me what two modifications will lead to the greatest expected reduction in systolic blood pressure. Are you surprised? Weight reduction, again, two-thirds of our population is overweight. That will work as long as the DASH diet, fruits, vegetables, whole grain. I know a lot of manufacturers are being told they need to reduce the amount of sodium in their food, and you don't need processed food to begin with. But if you're going to do that, sodium restriction is not going to give you the same results as eating more fruits and vegetables. Therapeutic lifestyle change, this is just from our guidelines talking about it. When the snowbirds come, more than two-thirds of them already have hypertension. Hypertension, if you probably talk with a pharmacist, is one of the top medications they have. But we're worried about children. Early habits will influence heart health in adulthood. And 90% of nearly 5,000 children had healthy blood pressure. But they weren't eating a healthy diet, and that's not going to pay off over the long run. If we have a patient who's normal tense of normal blood pressure at age 55, they're going to have hypertension later on. So most of our patients over 50, um, especially if they're overweight, have heart disease. And our risk factors are not going down. So if we're looking at blood pressure, we're looking at many different factors. But if you're in a nursing station, it's a colorful chart. But here we have ATP3, adult treatment panel. What does the green bar say? lifestyle modifications. And it reminds them, hey, before you start giving people drugs, let's talk about lifestyle. You're not going to process the meds. You're not going to reduce the risk if you don't have the healthier lifestyle of diet and exercise. So this is just from our new guidelines. I'm not going to test you on it. Um, but our guidelines have changed. And so what used to be okay is no longer okay. So you want to be proactive with your patients whenever you can. So our patients, we do screenings and we do health fairs. A lot of times we have to send them over to the hospital because their blood pressure, blood sugar is just too high. Lifestyle modifications always have a positive for our patients. So if our patient's blood pressure is at goal or stable, we follow up in three to six months. If they're on medication, you follow up with lab tests. Um, but when they've had heart failure or cardiac event, we follow more closely. So what is normal? What is not? I have the link for the new uh, guidelines in your notes. So we're looking at what is normal. It is not what used to be. So that's why one of the reasons we have a new textbook. CVA, cerebral vascular accident, brain attack, whatever you want to call it. It occurs when a blood vessel occurring, carrying oxygen and nutrients to the brain ruptures or is clogged by a blood clot interrupts blood flow to an area of the brain. As a result, the nerve cells in the area die. They lose the abilities, like walking, talking, feeding themselves at that area once controlled. Cerebral thrombosis, most common. Thrombosis forms, blocks blood flow to the brain. Occurs at night or first thing in the morning when their blood pressure is low. It's often preceded by what is commonly referred to as a mini stroke, a TIA. I've had students that have had strokes, and too many for me to be okay. So let's review. A stroke, you get help when the face looks uneven, an arm starts hangling, their slurred feet get help. The earlier you have intervention, we have many area um, hospitals that can give you good results. The earlier we get them, the better the results will be. Cerebral embolism, embolism forms away from the brain, carried until it lodges in the artery, blocks blood flow to the brain. A hemorrhage is just as it sounds. The blood vessel bursts on the brain, leads into the space between 
the skull and the brain. So we have to shunt off that extra blood. Left-sided stroke, less common. They have sight hearing loss. Right side, most of us are right-handed, aren't we? Feeding and swallowing difficulties. They lack the saliva production. They have trouble swallowing. Now, we said it was easier to swallow a thick liquid, like a smoothie, than it would be to swallow a juice. And they lack saliva production. Although they might have been eating for 50 years, they may think in their brain they're really swallowing, but they're not. So we've had students that go on into speech therapy because this is an area that's important to them because they've had family members that have it. So with a stroke, it can produce paralysis or sight or hearing, and that would infect their feeding. And we said that choking is a hazard. Um, things like dry, crisp, puree foods, you avoid those. Um, and the speech therapists would be working with them. We moisten the food, we add thickeners, things in your chart might be like nectar-like consistency. Sam had a stroke, and now he in rehab is now learning how to eat with his non-dominant arm. He has a nice bendy straw to make it a little more difficult. And it's a much more difficult if you've never tried it. The next time you eat, try eating with your non-dominant arm. There are other things, disease states like multiple sclerosis, head injuries that could lead to this as well. So like you see with arthritis grips and things like that, they don't have the same gross mortar skills. We'll see the same thing with our developmentally delayed patients. So we work on increasing their skills. Imagine you had peas, you know, if you were trying to scoop those peas, if you didn't have a rim, they'd be flying all over. You have suction cups because the trays are very glossy. So we give them dignity as they're relearning how to eat. Peripheral vascular disease. It's just as it sounds. It's a narrowing of the blood vessels in the legs, sometimes the arm. They have restrict blood flow, causes pain. They're not feeling their feet, you know, they get cold and blue. What leads to that? Smoking, high blood pressure, blood sugar out of control. So we're gonna come back and we'll do this again. We do our next chapter on diabetes. So grandma has achy, tired feeling and she, when she's walking and sometimes the area becomes cold or blue, peripheral vascular disease. They lose the movement or sensation. So they do surgery, they remove the obstructive fatty deposits, then they're told to eat a healthier diet. They have blood thinners, healthy diet, good foot care. So COPD is a condition you're hearing more about. It's an interrelated condition of chronic bronchitis and emphysema. The airflow is limited, respiratory failure develops, a very poor prognosis, they're gonna be malnourished. So with COPD, it's the interrelated system of chronic bronchitis and emphysema. So they're not getting enough oxygen. They're gonna have in decreasing pulmonary function. It's gonna be difficult to maintain their status. They're not gonna be able to get enough of a diet. And as we said, malnutrition, functioning. In this, and I'm gonna ask a test question on it, the preferred fuel is fats. Yes, I said it. So our goal is to give them enough calories they need. We can't overfeed them, they get tired really fast. So we can't especially overfeed carbohydrate. So as I said, the preferred fuel is fat. We limit the carb. Let's make this easy for you. If you have too much carb and you have COPD, it makes more carbon dioxide difficult to breathe, right? Maybe that'll help you remember. And we have something called, we are looking at the respiratory quotient of their diet. So in the circulatory system diseases, we now get to the lung complications. We can have pneumonia from different sources of infection. It could be aspiration of normal bacterial flora and gastric content, inhalation of a contaminant, contamination from systemic circulation. If you've had ammonia, you know that it's an exudate hard to expectorate, only bacterial, not viral. Hopefully our patients don't have possible acquired immune community-based pneumonia, and that has different pathogens involved. One, take the medication, usually a broad spectrum penicillin. They may need oxygen if it's as severe. Fluids, adequate fluids, small frequent meal, supplement is gonna help. Fiber for constipation, we want more. Uh, 
the potassium from our fruits and vegetables. Tuberculosis, we still have symptoms and cases in every county. Malaise, weight loss, fever, night sweats, blood streak, chronic cough, they are malnourished. They need to take their meds. They need to eat to take the meds to process the medication, and we need them to, to stick to the whole regimen. With TB, if they're feverish, anytime you have a fever, your basal metabolic rate, they go up. So our goal might be also there, giving them more calories. What do we want our patients to have better health? And so let's talk about health promotion. It comes from a healthy diet. Nutrition therapy for coronary heart disease focuses on the control of lipid factors, your saturated fat, animal fat, let's have more plant-centered, cholesterol. If you have a plant food, there's not going to be cholesterol in the food. It is also focusing on whole grains, fruits, vegetables, water-soluble fiber. As part of a healthy diet with exercise can cause significant cholesterol-lowering effects. So your gums, your pectins, you're thinking apple, metamucil, your beans, all of those are great. So they're great things that we can do to help lower that. So when we're looking at water-soluble fiber, it does so much more. It lowers your blood sugar, keeps you full if you're trying to lose weight, delays gastric emptying, slows intestinal transfer, it slows sugar absorption for especially our patients with insulin resistance, is fermented in the colon and short-chain fatty acid that may inhibit lipid cholesterol synthesis and help clear LDL. Now, omega-3, we're having more fish, more sea vegetables, marine oils, and these help to make the, the plasma fatty acid to alter the platelet aggregation so they're less sticky, so they don't cause blood clotting. They also decrease the VLDL, so they're an anti-inflammatory. Omega-3 is good. So if you have more soluble fiber, more fish and flax, you're going to do much better. There are many factors we can control. If someone's obese, we can work on that. We can change their lipids, their hypertension. Smoking, you know, we have so many different smoking programs. Even this campus is smoke-free. Physical activity, any exercise is better than no exercise at all. So we also talked about, and I alluded to, a family history of premature heart disease. What does that mean? A man under the age of 55, for instance, my dad had a massive stroke at 51, that's why I'm in this, I have a risk factor, or a woman under the age of 65. Now, as we get older, we're more likely to have surgery complications, we're more likely to have high blood pressure, higher cholesterol, so the risks go up. So our goal is for all of our patient lifestyle changes, diet and exercise. That's the basis of ATP3. If a patient has drugs, stick with the medication. Follow up on their blood pressure. Monitor that regularly. So we know that the two things that will lower it the most are a healthy diet and losing weight. Metabolic syndrome, three or five of the following, and we've covered that. So we're pretty good on that. We also know that if we don't control their blood pressure, it's going to affect their renal health, which we cover in two topics. Let's see what you remember. I also wanted to point out studies call, we're doing more studies on younger people because they're having strokes and heart attacks at an earlier point. So we want to be effective with our patients because they think they're immune from this and they're not. Patients with high LDL cholesterol should reduce their intake of polyunsaturated fat, monounsaturated fat, saturated fat, or all fats. One, two, three, or four. Three, saturated fat. It's always a good default answer. Patients with congestive heart failure, now the one that kind of looked like Homer Simpson, the pleural effusion swelling ankles, need to limit their intake of saturated fat, cholesterol, sodium, or calcium. One, two, three, four. Three. Sodium. Students usually miss that one. Individuals with high blood pressure would benefit from increasing their intake of soluble fiber and omega-3, fruits, vegetables, low-fat dairy, lean meats, legumes, and nuts, or polyunsaturated and monounsaturated fat. Two, fruits, vegetables, low-fat dairy, the DASH diet. 
told you I was going to ask questions. Patients with COPD can reduce the burden on their lungs by reducing their intake of carbohydrate, saturated fat, sodium, or cholesterol. The answer is carbohydrate. Carbohydrates produce more carbon dioxide. COPD is the only one where fat is the preferred fuel. Okay, your next lecture video will be on diabetes. If we have a patient with diabetes, we treat them like they have heart disease, which is why it follows this chapter.